Greetings all, Gerald Clark here with 7th Planet Broadcasting. It's Monday, May 30th, 2016. And today I'd like to finish up uh, an addendum to the Nibiru Orbital Update and talk about uh, some Earth changes that are probably coincident with what's going on with Nibiru. To begin with, I want to start with a link that a YouTube fan sent me that talks about an estimation for the arrival of Nibiru. And I've got this queued up, but you can see the link here. And I'll bring up the tab so we can start there. Okay. Looks like this one. Oops, that's not it. Okay, this one. So, I'm not going to go through the whole article for you, but I, what I want to point out is um, this particular individual, Luca Scantamberlo, did a really great job. It was published August 19, 2014. Um, a couple of things he did that I liked. Uh, number one, he um, estimated the aphelion location in order to start his calculations at uh, 50 billion miles, you can see right here. Um, and uh, kind of used the pretty standard equations to um, compute the approximate location of where the planet should be based on its orbital dynamics. And here you can see uh, some of the equations that are used for computing that. Okay. What I want to point also out, though, is that you really need to know the mass, uh, and you also need to know uh, the semi-major axis of the orbital ellipse, so that might be a guess. That's why you've got to use uh, what he did. And then you've got the orbital period, okay? So, and then there's a further equation that uh, requires the radius, or the distance between the two bodies. So there's a lot of things you have to assume here in order to get this right. So I didn't, I didn't um, agree with uh, the result of this article, but I appreciated the effort he put in in um, going through and doing the math. And you can see you used 3600 as the orbital period. So we've got two of the same things, a 3600-year orbital period and an aphelion of 50 billion miles. And that's what I wanted to start with. So let me go back to this report so we can get oriented here. So this was that uh, report that he did. The fan sent me a link, and I made a comment about uh, my response to the report because I was in the process of updating my own report as well. Okay, so uh, here's the individual's name. It was about two weeks ago. Um, I really liked the report, although the Newtonian equations are outdated for me. The author assumed 50 billion miles for an abelian aphelion, just as I did, and he also assumed the orbital period to be 3,600 years, so he could get the uh, half that period to calculate the velocity, much as I did. I did it in a much more simplistic way than he did, but uh, I think we both were trying to get to the same place. Okay, so what I want to focus on today is that in my last report, this new Buru orbital report that I did, I put in a table where it essentially tried to narrow down the arrival of Nibiru based on information we used in the IRS scope that was released in the newspapers in 1981. Okay, so one of those uh, papers was the New York Times, published Sunday, January 30th, 1981. And in that paper, Dr. Harrington states that he thinks Planet X, and this is as a result of the data from the IRS scope, is 5 billion miles, I'm going to highlight it right here, outside of Pluto's orbit, but does not indicate if he thinks it's it's the current position or aphelion. Okay, so if if its present location as of 1981 was 5 billion miles outside of Pluto, then we need to add Pluto's distance from the Sun, which is 3.67 billion miles. I said it says years, I should say miles. i got to fix that. Okay, and when you get that, those together, you add those together, you get 8.67 billion year, uh, miles. Okay, there's the years again. I wonder that was. Okay, now, so there's a hard number that we have from Harrington. Okay, and we're going to go to figure 11 in the Nibiru orbital report to see uh, this article that he posted. Okay, so let me see if I got that up here. There it is. Okay, so figure 11 right here. And this one's really hard to hard to see. You got I got to zoom it in really close, and it uh, 
I think it was in the upper right hand corner where he said this. Let me move that out of the way. Yeah, right up in here. If you read up in this part, you can see what uh, Dr. Harrington was saying about calculating the uh, distance. Okay, and he believes it's five billion. There it is. You got to look real close. Five billion miles beyond that of Pluto. Hardly next door, but still within the gravitational influence of the sun. Okay, so that was like I said, January 30th, 1981. Well, what does that give us if he's telling us something real? Well, it gives us the first point in a blink test. Okay, so I, so I, I put that back in the back of my head, and I thought, hmm, is there going to be more of those? Let me, let me just check. What else did he tell us? Okay, so the second piece of evidence that's going to lead us right to putting a fork in this expectation as much as we can is what happened in August 30th of 1990. During this video session between Dr. Sitchin and Harrington, and Dr. Harrington, being the chief astronomer of the United States Naval Observatory, he showed an orbital chart with Nibiru's location and path, if to scale, turns out to be 6.66 .6 billion miles from the sun. What if, what if that's a coincidence, 666? <laughs> anyway, that was recorded on August 30th, 1990. And I'm going to show you this video clip, uh, about five minutes of it. So that you can see where he shows the chart, where I took the chart off, and so that we can agreed together that we have two blank points from Dr. Harrington. And that's going to allow us to calculate the average velocity in that window and then go back and compare it with the velocity we did in the Nibiru orbital report and see how fast Nibiru has sped up based on if its average velocity uh, near aphelion. Because we know that when things get close to the sun and they're um, experiencing the sun's gravity effects, that gets it either gets captured by the sun, you get a, a sun diving object, or it gets slung shot around back out away from the sun, uh, which apparently is what happens with Nibiru. Okay, Okay. so let's go uh, now and watch this video here and see what Dr. Harrington and Dr. Sitchin uh, said together when they met in August of 1990. Okay, so let me get this tab here. Let's go back to here okay so right here let's blow this up NASA launched the pioneer 10 spacecraft in 1972 it attached to it a golden plaque with this plaque pioneer carries a message to extraterrestrials about its home planet its symbols show the radio signature of our sun where our planet is located and what we looked like as Pioneer 10 journeys on beyond the outer known planets, the date it is sending back is also being used to seek a possible 10th planet. Indeed, a March 1992 NASA press release stated, Unexplained deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer solar system body of 4 to 8 Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit beyond 7 billion miles from the Sun. In the past two decades, astronomers have joined the search to look for one more planet in our own solar system. They designate such a planet, Planet X, meaning both unknown and tenth. of their discoveries. <clears throat> I'd be happy to, but, and you're absolutely right. And as a matter of fact, the date on here I was just noticing is um, 14 August 1978, which was just about six weeks after we discovered the fact that Pluto has a satellite. Once you have a satellite for a planet, you can determine how heavy it is. It turns out Pluto was very much smaller and lighter weight than we had thought, which meant that Pluto has no influence, no appreciable influence on the motions of the planets Uranus and Neptune. At that point, we voiced a hypothesis that this means that there is at least one yet to be discovered planet in the outer reaches of the solar system. And this naturally led directly to you and, and your interest in what we're doing. And that's when you, you sent me this book. 
you have then postulated the existence or, or the appearance in some 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 time aeons ago uh, of of a, a celestial body which you I think named in that uh, paper uh, an intruder, yes. which may have uh, collided with or or, or somehow. Uh, turned on, on their side both Uranus and Pluto. Uh, it did a lot more than that, as a matter of fact. In that paper, we hypothesized that this intruder passed very close to Neptune, that it dislodged one of what we then think were many satellites of Neptune, and one of them became the planet Pluto. We actually think Pluto was an escaped satellite of Neptune. This will also take the orbit of Triton, the big satellite of Neptune, and reverse it. We'll take the orbit of the satellite near read and extend it outwards. We can produce all of the observed aspects of the satellite system of Neptune plus Pluto's orbit just with this one single intruding planet. Uh, one of the things we, we did in 1978, having made this prediction that there was a, an additional planet, 10th or 12th, depending on your point of view, but it's the, the next one, um, we sort of put our money where our mouth was, as it were, and we went out and we started looking for this thing. In the, We've been searching for 12 years for this thing. We've been able to refine the search area somewhat, um, get it rather narrowed down. We, we do our predictions based on the observed anomalies in Uranus and Neptune. We actually are currently looking down in the region of Centaurus, which is just south of the, of the constellation Libra, but very close to the area that you've talked about. I think, uh, Dr. Harrington, you have a pretty good picture at least in your own mind of what we are talking about, a big planet, a small planet. Uh. But if, if it is in the kind of orbit that we describe here, it would have to be a planet that would have a mass something like three to five times the mass of the Earth. This would put it uh, intermediate between the gaseous planets like Uranus and Neptune and the terrestrial planets that we, we have in the inner part of the solar system. So if if this planet turns out to be in a 3,600 year orbit, then its, its mass would be correspondingly larger. But we're talking about something that's it's a perfectly reasonable kind of planet. It looks like a good, nice planet, uh, small enough that it's not going to be completely enveloped in gas, so it's perfectly capable of supporting uh, life forms of one kind or another. This one here is a map of the solar system as we know it. Uh, the inner planets, this is the orbit of planet Pluto, and this here is the orbit that I have proposed for uh, the tenth planet, and here's where we think it is right about now in its orbit. This is your orbit for the planet, yes. and uh, um, showing that it would come out of Sagittarius in biblical time, and that once you allow for precession, it would be around into Libra by now, and, uh, which is, again, approximately the area that we're looking in. If planet X exists, we are not alone in this solar system. Astronomers are so sure of the 10th planet, they think there is nothing left but to name it. Okay, <clears throat> so this map is very important. Um, in a later map in the video, you can watch the rest of it, um, you can see that in Libra here, this is where um, Dr. Harrington believed the path was, and his dot was exactly the same radius from the center where the sun is as this one. Okay, they did not disagree about that. So you can see this line pointing from here to here is, is going to turn out to be very important. Okay, so let's go back to uh, our report and see what we can figure out from that. Okay, so <clears throat> we watched the video. Now here's the uh, diagram that he was showing, pointing with his very own finger to that dot, okay? He said that's where uh, Nibiru is. Now, <clears throat> so what can, what can we do with this? Uh, we had a first blink that was given to us in 1981 that said it's 5 billion miles outside of Pluto. That's 8.67 billion miles, okay? This time is August of 1990. That's nine years later. That's a very long blink test, okay? So, what, what are we looking at in this chart, okay? Clearly, there's the retrograde orbit of Nibiru. 
it's in this particular zodiacal house that you can't read very well. Here's Libra down here. Um, and what, what's really important is uh, these inner orbits here show you uh, the pathways all of the inner planets, but they don't show you the size. They just show you the orbital path. So that, but we know what that distance is. This distance from the Sun out to Pluto's orbital path is 3.67 billion miles. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take the known distance, 3.67, and then I'm going to measure this line and use that as a relationship. Measure this line, use that as a relationship from the center here to where Nibiru is, and then solve for the unknown variable of uh, the actual distance uh, in a linear analysis. Okay, so it's pretty simple, but the fact is he was carrying around a chart that most scientists would not carry around unless it was to scale, okay, unless you're doing a PowerPoint presentation, it doesn't really matter. Um, he was pulling at a very large piece of paper that clearly was dimensionally scaled, and this was a small piece of it, okay? So, here's what we want to do. We've got an easy test to check whether this thing is to scale. Number one, we measure the distance Pluto is to the Sun, which we know is a given, it's 3.67 billion miles. Then we do a, a li, uh, we have a linear measurement using the red line pointing to the orbital path of Pluto. Now it doesn't really matter what size you print this picture out from, as long as you don't change the relational scale of, of the original picture. Okay, so if you stretch one side, not the other, um, you could change the relationship of these lines to each other uh, relative to these objects. But if you don't, everything is to scale. Okay. All right, so the second thing, so and I measured mine to be 1.46 inches. So this little short line right here, with however I printed it out on my uh, image size was 1.46 inches, okay? Then we're gonna do the same thing with uh, this next, so the next distance we measure is from the distance from, from the sun, okay? To this image that he's got pointed out, and this is the yellow line here, okay? Now, we know he just said uh, that, well, let's go, let's go through it one step at a time. So this is the distance from the sun to the bureau. All right. So this, and then I'm going to get a measurement for that. And it's 2.65 inches. All right. So now using a, this little simple equivalence technique, I'll set uh, these variables related to each other because they're, because their ratio would be equivalent if there was no stretching in the picture. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm going to use these numbers I got, and the variable that we're going to try to solve for is the distance that that dot is from the sun, okay? Because we knew what the distance from the sun to Pluto was, and all the other ones for that matter. Okay, so let's set up this relationship. We have 1.46 inches is related to 3.67 billion miles. I left the, the uh, indication or the units of measure off of the numbers, okay? And that's equal to 2.65 inches as is to x, okay? So when we set those equivalent, what I'm going to do is solve for x, and we'll have this relationship. Very simple. And when you solve for x, it equals 6.66 billion miles from the sun, okay? Which is reasonable. Uh, this is 3.67, this is 6.66 billion, and 8.67 billion about five billion miles out would be about here okay so that's about that's about right okay so this is where it would have been in um, 1981 and this is how far it moved over to in 1990 okay in August so why do we why do we care about that okay so we got an approximation which by the way if you watch that video that I just showed you he, they said that it was approximately 7 billion miles from the sun. Well, look at this, 6.66 billion. So what I'm telling you is that orbital chart that Dr. Harrington had was to scale. And that's very important because it gives us our second blink point. And with that, we can do some really great things, okay? So, by the way, this disagrees with Neugebauer's claim that Planet X was at approximately 50 billion miles away in that 1981 article, okay? <clears throat> now, I believe, personally, what he disclosed in the math works was that was the aphelion distance for the Nibiru complex, not the current location, as Dr. Harrington did. 
So 50 billion miles works out pretty well if you calculate an average velocity and go, well, that's a pretty far piece outside of Pluto. Nobody can see it for a very long time. And uh, the numbers actually kind of work. So, And also, that's the same number that was used inside this uh, approximation report in the first link that I gave you, 50 billion miles. Okay, so now this... Um, well, let's take a difference between these two distances. We had uh, 8.67 billion miles and 6.6 uh, uh, .6 billion. Well, if you take the difference of those, you end up with 2.01 billion miles. That's how far it traveled in approximately nine years from 1981 to 1990. And I don't know exactly what month uh, we should use for the, the um, 1981 report. Because when, when they took it versus when it showed up in the paper is quite a different matter. So it'll be off by a few months, but it shouldn't affect the overall velocity very much. Okay, so now what we want to do is no, we want to know um, the average velocity that Nibiru was moving if it went 2.01 billion miles in nine years. So it may have gone fast or slow, but all we're going to get is the average. So if you take a long blink window, you get, a, you get more averaging than if you take a short set of blink windows because then you can get the average relative to its previous velocity or its, its current velocity relative to its previous one so you can see what the rate of change is or if there's any acceleration. Um, so that's, that's really important information. Okay, so now let's finish this up. So if that, in that case, if we want to know what the average velocity in miles per hour was, here's the, the math. 2.1 billion miles divided by 9 years times 365 days per year times 24 hours a day, okay? That'll give you 25,494 miles per hour. That's how fast it was traveling at the last point in August of 1990 if the orbital chart that Harrington showed us was to scale. Okay, so this this left me with kind of a very interesting thought. Well, this makes you go, okay, well, if it's traveling that fast then, how long until it makes it to aphelion? That would be the next logical question. But before I did that, I wanted to compare that velocity, this one, with the velocity that it came up with in the report, assuming 50 billion miles uh, for aphelion to perihelion, you know, that's half the distance of its orbit, just a straight line down the middle, and we knew it took 1,800 years, so we calculated an average velocity of 3,170 miles per hour. Well, look at the, the, this velocity versus the one that we measured in 1990. This is quite interesting, okay? So it's almost eight times faster. That's how much it sped up. And that number is going to become really important as, you, as we go back to the Nibiru orbital table in just a minute and kind of make sure these numbers make sense. So I'm, I'm good, coming at this from multiple directions to make sure that what the math says, what the data from the IRS satellite says is accurate. And I think this is about as accurate as we can get it without having more information. <clears throat> so, um, so here's the question. Then how long would it take Nabu to arrive at the sun using this average rate? Okay. No slingshot scale applied if it was known to be 6.6 .6 billion miles from the sun. Now, I'm talking about this average rate, not the previous one, because we already did this one. Okay, we had to come up with orbital scalars in close to bring it in, and we ranged from uh, 4 to 7. You'll see that in a minute. So, let's do the math. <clears throat> if it travels at 25,494 miles per hour, and it's got to go 6.6 .6 billion miles to get to the sun, then, it's, then in the worst case, absolute worst case, it comes out to 29.55 years, okay, from, from that point in August of 1990, when he gave us the orbital chart, assuming it was done sometime close to that date, that it would take 29.55 years, okay, so let's just add those together, 1990 plus 29.55 ends you up in 2019, okay, so that's absolute worst case if it kept going at that speed. The reality is it gets closer, it goes faster. So that uh, <clears throat> you can see that. Here's the average velocity and here's the velocity that it sped up to by the time it got in close to uh, Pluto. Okay. So uh, 
Uh, so my conclusion is this co in the comment of this YouTube video was, there you have it. It's simple. It's due here now, as my report shows. So uh, I went just a little bit farther here, and I, I added a couple more notes. So this blink rate from 81 to 90 increased to 25,494 miles per hour. That's an eight, about an 8x increase from the average velocity it would take to travel the 50 billion miles from solar aphelion to perihelion. Now, I'm going to take you back to the report in just a second and show you this. This is the scalar I was looking for in my report. And if you note, in the first table, I guessed 4 based on a certain distance from the sun. And I was playing the same game. If it's out near Pluto, how long would it take to come in? In the second table, I chose 7. And uh, it turns out that if you look at this, assuming it doesn't increase anymore, it turns out to be a, a factor of eight. So that's very, very telling to me. And uh, one other thing I wanted to close out this, uh, this part with before I go show you this table was uh, Harrington was not in Black Birch, New Zealand in 1991 to get another velocity point for his blank. According to the report I read recently, he was there to get a third data point in order to refine the trajectory to determine exactly where in this constellation of Libra he believed it was coming in. Okay, so um, I'm going to just visit this report just real quickly to take you back to this table so we can do that. Um, hopefully I didn't go too far. Oh, no, we didn't. Let's go the other way. Okay, <clears throat> so this will be real quick. I won't dwell on this too much, but I want you to see after we did this how close it came out to, okay, here we go. Okay, so this was the first table, table three in the Dubu Orbital Report, where I was picking scalars in this column here. You can see that. Okay, so when we got down to a scalar of four, and this is assuming we were next to Pluto, average velocity, which if you realize now, this is about 3,000 something, 3,100 miles per hour. Okay, this is miles per year. Okay. So it comes out to about 3,100 miles per hour. So if you didn't change its velocity at all, um, it'd take 132 years to make it. But if you changed it by a factor of four, it made it here in 33 years. Hmm. So I just showed you the, the, the blink rate that we just looked at was actually eight times faster than the average velocity, which means uh, it's not going to take that long, okay? All right, <clears throat> so here was the second where I said, let's go out to the 6.6 .6 billion miles, stay at that average rate, uh, not right next to Pluto, but this one is out where the dot was on uh, the orbital chart from Harrington, okay, that I showed you. Well, now you look um, down these scalars, and you can see when you get down to about a 7 right here, it says, oh, I might be here about 2017. But if it's somewhere between 7 and 8, and this is a misprint, that should say 2012. So, so you could find the exact number, but between 7 and 8, if you just used an integer, it would be between 2012 and 2017. Okay, so those are some, you know, that's not a, a great window, but between the two of them, you can come up with a window that is about a year long based on these numbers. Okay, and then to put the final uh, fork in it, I want you to now look, if you add 29.55 years to 1990, month of August, it comes out to 2019, and that's with no orbital scale increase. So if you add this orbital scale increase, this number goes down, and this number goes down too. So we're talking about now, right now, okay? So I want to drive that point home. Uh, and what evidence do we have to say that maybe some planetary body or constellation is perturbing the Earth and its and other other planetary bodies? Well, let's go and talk about a couple things that are happening. Um, recently, as you know or may not have heard, some of the Solomon Islands uh, are getting overrun by by uh, rising ocean tides. Okay, according to this article from Popular Science, written by Christine June on May 16th, so this is recent, um, they were looking at why several of the Solomon Islands are now being subsumed by this water model that's being shown here. Okay, 
And the basis of this article was uh, don't blame climate change. You know, everybody's saying, well, greenhouse gases, ice melts on the poles, ocean tides rise. Well, that would, you know, that's a very simplistic uh, model, but the reality is this scientist is saying, no, there's something much bigger that's causing energy to be released in the ocean that's causing wave energy that's busting the water out of its basin, essentially. And it has nothing to do with uh, <laughs> greenhouse gases or global warming. So that's one instance that I thought was very interesting, and I'll leave a link to this article so you folks can look this up. Um, another... Uh, very strange uh, occurrence is, uh, let's see, is this it? Yeah, um, dozens of large earthquakes strike Japan uh, it, as its southern island may split. Okay, and this was from uh, zerohedge.com, a very recent article. And I'd been watching the earthquakes go on in Japan, but when I s saw some of these <laughs> pictures of uh, the entire um, area along here splitting, I was like, Wow, this is some serious uh, plate tectonic activity. So uh, I thought that was noteworthy. And, you know, it's not just happening in Japan. It's happening all over the place. So if you look at um, earthquakes from the United States Geological Survey, um, these are worldwide deadly and destructive earthquakes between magnitude 6 and 8. <clears throat> so if you start back here at 1901, you can see there were very few, and these are number, number, just simple number of quakes. There's five, 10, 15, okay. And there weren't that many, you know, get to 1935, looks like you might have had eight of them, okay. Well, now we're here in 2005 forward, and we're looking at here, just this particular, it looks like 2010, it looks like there were 47 earthquakes between magnitude six and eight. So you can see this chart is increasing for some reason, and suddenly it created a very large spike here. And it, I'm sorry, we don't have the data for 2015, 2016 up in here that would fill in this, to let you know even more. And I've, I've seen actually uh, total numbers of quakes that were much higher than these, but uh, I'll let Dutch Sense and those guys uh, deal with these. I just wanted to bring in some corroborating evidence to show that, you know, this has been on the rise for a while, and then we had a, quite a sudden increase. And similarly, uh, earthquakes and volcanoes kind of go together. So this goes from the 1800s. This is the total number of all volcanoes erupting. And then these are eruptions that were uh, a certain magnitude. Okay, well, if you start out here, um, these, are, these are volcanoes active per year, and the red line is the average, okay? So here we had about oh, 17 volcanoes per year in the 1800s. Now here we are in just, you know, in the 2000s, and we don't have exactly to the, our current date here, but you can see we're up here near um, approximately 75 volcanoes um, active um, per year. Not, um, not the big ones, like I, I heard recently there were 44 volcanoes active at the same time. Um, and maybe that's the case, but these are this is for the whole year, okay? <laughs> so we're talking about 45 of them right in this vicinity here, active at the same time, not accumulated over the whole year. So this so this chart kind of speaks for itself what's going on here. Uh, we're clearly approaching some uh, perturbing event that's not just affecting the air we breathe, but it's affecting the entire planetary wobble, its magnetic pole. And, uh, and, that, and subsequently, the water being infused with energy from the motions of the Earth, so tidal actions are getting more significant, and the volcanoes also corroborate with the earthquakes. So I want you to consider what the uh, Nibiru Orbital Update Report is stating, no matter what you see shown on, on a YouTube video or what's in the sky or whether this is a lens flare or that's a real video or just what. The math doesn't lie if what was given to us by those scientists in 1981 is correct. Okay? This math is accurate. So what I'm telling you is, it, even if it was off by a year, being this close, there's an outside force that is disturbing the Earth. And the, the entire climate change movement to blame it on humans is a complete farce. Don't fall for it.
This has been Gerald Clark, 7th Planet Broadcasting, and we out.